All right, so I am going to talk a little bit about Odyssey. I'm going to do a few slides introducing what Odyssey does and then talk about how we do prediction in there. And then I added a slide at the end based on the earlier talks to talk a little bit more about prediction. Um, I guess I have the slide advancer. So Odyssey is an international collaboration to generate evidence. It has participants from around the world, over 200 collaborators, 25 countries, and half a billion unique patients in its federated database. It generates three kinds of evidence. It tallies things, it does comparative effectiveness research, and it does prediction. I'm gonna focus on the third one. Um, it's an open science initiative, uh, which is not just open source, but we publish everything we do. How do you collect half a billion patients' records? You don't. You do a collaboration where everyone converts their database to a common format, and then you distribute the query, and they send the answer back. Uh, you have a common data model. Here's the schema. <clears throat> and you translate, since you're a worldwide initiative, you translate vocabularies, 100 vocabularies from around the world to a standard set, which is stuff you've heard of, SNOMED, ArxNorm, LOINC. You provide tools to do the research. And now I'm just going to give you a few examples and then get into prediction. Uh, our first large-scale study was actually that first one, tallying or counting things. And it was, uh, let's just ask the question as a, as a test case for three diseases, diabetes, hypertension, and depression, how is that treated around the world? We know what the guidelines are, but what are people actually doing around the world? We did 240 million patients from around the world, 12 databases. In this slide, we show only three databases for each disease for illustration. The inner circle is the first drug, second drug, third drug on your way out from the circles. And what we see here, if I can find it, uh, there we are. This is metformin in the US. This is metformin in the UK. So people start on metformin, so our guideline is successful. Uh, but <clears throat> if you look at all the other databases, they look just like this, except for Japan. Japan is the only country that doesn't use so much metformin. South Korea looks just like the US. Hong Kong looks just like the US. It was only the Japan, which I assume was some formulary issue where they didn't want to pay for it or they paid for an alternate form. But a Japanese physiologist says that the belief is that Japanese patients are genetically different, don't get insulin resistance, and therefore don't do well on metformin, and they use other drugs. <clears throat> you go to the literature, Actually, there's three papers with a sentence that mentions they may be different epidemiologically. There's not a lot on it, but the doctors there apparently believe it sufficiently not to order the drug. For hypertension, we see less agreement, and for diabetes, it's pretty much a random pick of drugs, and these are three U.S. databases that look so different from each other. The interesting thing on hypertension is that a third, no, a quarter of people took a sequence of drugs for hypertension that no one else in our database took. So like if you look someone up and said, I took this drug, that drug, then that drug is how my doctor switched me. When you looked in the database and said, what did someone else who had this you know, sequence do? No one else had that sequence. So we're, we have very variable treatment. <clears throat> Second example, quickly, howoften.org. If your family member has a new prescription, you want to just check what the incident rate is for every drug in the world, for every side effect in SNOMED, which is 300,000, it lists the absolute risk. So this is not the attributable risk. It's not causal. It means people on statins get a lot of heart attacks, not because statins cause it, because you got the statin because you were at risk for a heart attack. But it gives you an upper limit of your rate. It's, we haven't really fixed the website yet, so it's, um, you got to do it um, the generic name. We studied the literature. We parsed 30,000 observational research studies, and we found severe publication bias. This is a, a graph of the effect size by its, by its standard error. So this is not significant. This is harmful, and this is protective. And what we see is if it's harmful or protective but statistically significant, they publish it. But if it's not statistically significant, they don't bother publishing it. We also found evidence of p-hacking on the edges here. So that's what's happening. So basically what this says is that the li if you don't know what this is, then you don't <clears throat> then you don't know what the denominator is. You don't know how predictive these are. So the literature is basically a data dredging scheme. So we do it at large scale. We use a number of techniques that'll be relevant for the predictive models, but we use um, large scale 
propensity score matching, so we actually balance on 10,000 variables, and we use negative controls, but we use 75 of them, not just one. So we balance on, set, and if you, if you take our table one in our papers, table one is 10,000 rows long, and it's balanced on every single one using our technique. And when we do our studies, uh, we get the, uh, we don't have publication bias because we do it all, so then if you move into hypertension, so we did a large-scale study on hypertension. You may not, the, the guideline published last year, you may not realize that 89% of the, of the hypertension guidelines basically expert opinion because we only have evidence for 11% of the recommendations because there's only 40 trials. So we said, let's just go ahead and do the whole guideline, and here it is with 10,000 trials. We believe that every one of those 10,000 is probably the best study that's ever been done on that specific hypothesis because we're able to balance on everything. Our results corroborate the guideline. I won't, this is my last slide pre-prediction. Uh, uh, I, I won't go into details on why, but this green, this purple, and that gray means that our guideline is actually pretty good, but we do find that ACE inhibitors are not as good as thiazide diuretics. Half the world population starts when they start with hypertension, start on ACE inhibitors, we find that it's both, if we completely open, overlap all the randomized trials, we have narrower confidence intervals, we find better safety and better efficacy. So start an ARB or start a thiazide, but don't start an ACE unless you have a, a clinical, a physiologic reason to specifically start an ACE inhibitor. So that's the kind of research we do, but our third area was uh, patient level prediction. So we have our framework, which kind of makes sense to find a prediction problem it says select variables, train the model. The difference is that we do it at large scale. The big thing here is find a way of designing a study that can be automated. And then you can do many hypotheses. And automate it only, it only if you can automate it so that you're actually better than someone manually doing it. If you're picking the variables and you have to get those variables right, I guarantee human beings are going to miss one and include one they shouldn't have. So it's not clear that the automated method is not as good as a manual selection of variables. Here's the kinds of questions we answer, so disease, onset, and progression, treatment choice, treatment response, treatment safety, treatment adherence. Uh, this is not causal. I'm going to cover this in the last slide. So there's prediction of risk, and there's the counterfactual in predicting causes, and I'm going to go more detail at the end, so let me save it for then. Uh, how do we evaluate? Uh, well, we use ROC curves. I won't go into detail on this slide. I'm just going to say we, you know, discrimination power. We, of course, look at calibration, shown here. And we look at subpopulation calibration here, stratifying by age and sex and showing that it matches the observed fairly well. And um, very important, and this is something that uniquely Odyssey can supply, is it does uh, verification across many databases. I'm going to show you some slides that go into more detail there. So for how would you use it? Well, if you do many diagnoses at once, you would imagine a panel of diagnoses, and then you input the variables for that patient, and then it would produce different predictions, this one being an 18-year-old woman, or the 76-year-old man, or the 79-year-old woman, where different things pop up red. But then we'd have to talk very carefully about how do we use these predictions and what is the false positive rate. So I don't want to go into too much detail on that part, but if you start predicting 1,000 diseases, a lot of them are going to be positives. You have to p figure out the false positives. <clears throat> so here's an example, stroke risk in the setting of atrial fibrillation. Um, below the line means it's protective, or green means it's protective, red means it's uh, harmful. So. Uh, we see a lower age, younger patients are less likely, and patients with uh, type 2 diabetes are more likely to uh, get a stroke in the setting of atrial fibrillation. <clears throat> when we do this analysis, first of all, we duplicate the current clinical predictor that people use, the CHADS2 predictor. We find other variables that make sense, and we find other variables that we need to look into further. So now here's a, um, a graph, uh, a, a plot of, so these are different diseases. So we look at stroke, we look at four different databases, and within each database there are three boxes for three different methods, which happen to be gradient boosting, random forest, regularized regression. We also have, you know, deep learning and things like that, but that's what's shown in this slide. <clears throat> if I go now more generally to different outcomes, 
Oh, first of all, before I do that, you see different databases perform differently. So you see that this is private payer, Medicaid, Medicare, and another private payer. You see the green means the highest predictive value, red is the worst. Medicare does the worst, why is that? It's probably because Medicare is the hardest because if you have a database of young people, it's easy to predict who's not gonna get heart failure. The five-year-olds are not gonna get heart failure for the most part. If you have a database of sick old people, then figure out which ones are gonna have heart failure is a harder problem. And so the AUC really should be normalized to the severity, but if you don't do that, you're gonna get better, worse prediction. In a, so if you try to predict who with heart failure in the past is gonna get heart failure in the future, that's hard. If you wanna predict who's gonna get heart failure in the past, just in the future, just ask who had it in the past. So that's one thing that comes in which really should be factored out. If we look across diseases, we do a good job predicting stroke, hypothyroidism, uh, uh, acute uh, myocardial infarction, not predicting diarrhea and nausea because they're probably because they're vague symptoms, probably not documented reliably, and because they have many causes. <clears throat> so these are the ones that have AUCs over 0.75. As you see, the Medicare database is the lowest. Uh, best performing is 86. I guess that's relevant. Um, looking at model discrimination, you see that each of these triplets tend to look similar. These three all look green together. There are some differences, like this shown right here, where this is lightish green, and this is not red, but it's an orangish. So there is some difference among the algorithms. For the most part, we find the algorithms, as, as often is found in machine learning, the algorithms are not the big difference. It's the data and what you're trying to predict. So then we can compare databases, um, transportability, actually. So what I'm going to do is build it in one database and test it in another. And as we see here, um, transportability to Medicare is, is the worst. Even worse than from is going to Medicare. And that makes sense because if you're going from a database with a general population, you're gonna, you, you haven't even had the chance to optimize on an old population, and so you're going to do the worst prediction there. Uh, whereas between CCAE and Optum, which are both private payer general population databases, uh, the prediction, it doesn't matter where you started the algorithm, it works well in the opposite. So first, the conclusions about this, and then I'm going to spend a little time on some separate comments. <clears throat> first of all, it's feasible to create an enormous international research network, and sites will volunteer to run studies for you, and no one's paying anyone to do anything, for the most part. I mean, each site has its own sources of funding, I should say. Patient-level prediction can advance the notion of precision medicine by identifying subpopulations at high or low risk. Um, and then what was a, a kind of a point that was made in the early talks today, um, this doesn't have to be post hoc, this is paraphrasing it positively, this doesn't have to be post hoc research but can be integrated into the healthcare delivery system. Well, I'll put it a little differently. The hard part is integrating into the healthcare delivery system and how do you get these models used and which ones should be used. So that is where a lot of the uh, work has to be done. Okay. So now I want to make some comments about prediction. So first, what I've been talking about, I think what Ian Buchan has a nice little talk about, not little, nice talk about stratified medicine. So if you look at precision medicine, it's kind of like, well, it's probably more than two, but two uh, pushes. One is to look at subpopulations and stratify, and then genomics in that case adds strata to your analysis, but otherwise your analysis doesn't look too different. A different approach is N of 1 and using physiology. If you're going to incorporate genomic information, it's actually at the physiologic level. So what we're talking about mostly today is stratification and polygenic risk scores. We don't have the genome, we don't have the deep physiology of that. We're really just doing as a predictor. So let me give you an example. If we have perfect calibration, we have two algorithms. They both have perfect calibration, which you can trust me on. They both have AUCs of 0.95. So very high, or 0.97. And we take a patient, and one says the patient has 10% chance of risking, uh, risk of dying tomorrow, and the other says 90%. So what's going on there? Is one wrong? What is the patient supposed to do? So first, the answer is they're both right. A patient is a one or a zero. They're either going to die tomorrow or not. We just don't know it yet. The risk is for a subpopulation that that patient is assigned to. 
If that patient gets assigned to one risk group by one model and a different risk group by another model, that model can still have perfect calibration and an AUC of 0.95. Does the patient think they're going to die tomorrow or not? I don't know. Like if it depends on their address, the first letter of their street address and is an M and they happen to be high risk in the training set, they may be lumped with them and in fact their risk may be 90% among people who have M's for the first letter of their address. So uh, until you understand that that's what you're doing, you're predicting for a population. Now why is that important here? Well, as we do deep learning, that can accelerate this. Because logistic regression with naive Bayes, you kind of know what you're getting. It's a linear model, there's a couple of variables, I can't get it that wrong. With deep learning, we have many degrees of freedom and it's possible to put patients in categories because the first letter of their address is an M. You don't know where it's putting people and you can have the same patient on two different models, come up with very different predictions and both those predictions are right and then you have to decide what the patient should do based on that. The other th important point is you can't predict the effect of altering behavior. We're doing risk prediction. We're not doing causality, most of the models that we're talking about today. The example is um, if you do a prediction model on carrying a cigarette li lighter and lung cancer, you're going to find it's highly predictive. I don't want to get lung cancer. I'm just going to stop carrying a cigarette lighter. I look on the model. The model says if you don't carry a cigarette lighter, you don't get lung cancer. Well, if I don't stop smoking, I'm still going to get lung cancer. You can't move yourself from one risk group to another risk group. Your risk group is only pre. The only way to do training on this is if you have a population that has done the switch from high risk to low risk and you see what happened in them. Then you can say the change in risk. Or you need a deep uh, treatment of causality. Um, and then lastly, I've already said it, is we need to uh, scale to many diseases and populations. And to do that, you create a repeatable process that is as good as the manual one. And then you can study the operating characteristics and you can say things like, um, on average, our prediction does well or not. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, David Valley, one question, quick. Quick question, quick answer. Well, this, this seems to me to be um, very well done populational medicine. But as a physician, I'm more interested in the patient sitting across the desk from me. And, and I didn't hear genetics very much in this uh, analysis. Okay, so the, so the genetics, this is the, e so we haven't done genetics in this project, but I was invited to talk about the EHR side of it, so that's what I'm showing. And then, yes, those predict, I haven't, the slides I showed where we had specific patients in their risk, that is the panel that the doctor would use, but we haven't put it into production yet, so I don't have a real doctor using it today. But that is how it would be used, was those slides that showed the, indivi the three individual patients and in their risk panel. 